homecoming and this talk is going to be about my interesting project that I did last summer which was about agent optimization in chemistry which yeah as you said has been quite a popular topic these past few days um, so, yeah so just starting off just general optimization so there are quite a few different scientific problems that can be considered as optimization problems so, for example, if you're trying to do some clinical trials and trying to find a drug that has the best efficacy while at the same time not being that toxic, or maybe there's some industrial process that you're trying to optimize the cost of, maybe in terms of either materials or how much energy you're using. Or, as was mostly the case with my project last year, reaction yield optimization. So you've got some chemical reaction and you can vary the reaction conditions in some respect, and you're trying to find the reaction conditions that give you the best yield. Now, for some of these problems, you already have quite good physical models that can help guide your intuition. So if you're trying to, if you're only changing the pressure and temperature of some industrial reaction, it's quite easy to build a model of how much energy that's going to cost um, to maintain those particular conditions. And so it's not that difficult to just brute force an actual solution just with some like simple models. But if it's something like a chemical reaction, we've got lots of different complex factors at play, like which catalyst you're using, different ligands or bases, how the different chemicals interact with each other. It's not as easy to build such a simple model. And of course, chemical reactions can take hours or days to complete. So trying out every single possible reaction condition is not feasible either. So the solution, or a solution rather, is the use of a technique called Bayesian optimization. So the idea is that you start off with your search space, which is, in, in our case, for example, the set of possible reaction conditions, and you fit some initial statistical model to that search space. So at each point in the space, it's going to give an estimate of how good the yield will be, but also maybe some uncertainty in that estimate. After that, you apply what's called an acquisition function, which takes in that statistical model and estimates the utility of running an experiment with those conditions. So, For example, if you had an experiment which had very high predicted yield, maybe a lot higher than your current best observed yield, then it would make sense to run that experiment, because then you're likely to improve on your current optimal value. But at the same time, if you're looking at an uh, experiment which has maybe middling predicted yield, but quite a large amount of uncertainty, that might represent an experiment in a previously unexplored part of your space. So it might be good to run an experiment there in order to gain a lot more information about what conditions near that condition tend to give in terms of yield. So either of those can be um, taken into account in, in your acquisition function. But in any case, you're going to run the experiments or perhaps experiments with maximum utility. After all, sometimes if you, even though you can't necessarily do hundreds of reactions in parallel, you might be able to do five or 10 in parallel at each round, which would be better than just doing a single one at each round as a gaining information. After that, you record the results of those experiments. So in our, in our case, that would be the yields you actually got and you feed back into the model. And the reason why it's called Bayesian optimization is that at each stage, you're conditioning on the experiment results already identified in order to further refine them. So the two main acquisition functions that we looked at in the project were expected improvement, which looks at the average improvement based on the current best value. So if the best value was 10 and maybe the predicted value was 11 with an uncertainty of two, maybe the expected improvement would be about three or four from, if you're subtracting from 10. Um, another method to do that is Thompson sum. So where you take your statistical model and you like flip a coin at each point in your space to actually generate a yield value based on your probability distribution. And you use those sampled values as the actual utility. So that, that's an inherently random process. So if you try to do Thompson sampling, um, on the same model multiple times, you'll probably get different results. So the overall goals of the project were, there was this 
optimizer we identified from a table released in Nature called the Experimental, Experimental Design in Bayesian Optimization, or EDVO Optimizer. So we wanted to verify the results from that paper, then test the robustness of the performance of the optimizer subject to changing some of the parameters slightly in the model, essentially seeing whether or not we could break the optimizer. And then beyond that, we tried to see if we could extend the optimizer we found in that paper, which was just used for reaction yield optimization, to a wide variety of different problem domains. So this, this data set is one of the training data sets that the Edge optimizer was tested on. So this one has about 3,600 different possible reaction conditions. I don't remember the exact amounts, but maybe something like 10 different ligands, five different braces, et cetera, et cetera. And you multiply them all together to generate your search space. Um, so the way it worked is that each optimizer run had a constant experimental budget of 50. So we had like an Excel spreadsheet with all the different yield values for different conditions. And it's allowed to read off the yield values from 50 of those um, cells. Um, but what we varied was the batch size. So if you had a batch size of one, you would do like 50 rounds of optimization. And at each point, you're selecting one experiment. But obviously, if you're working in an actual lab, it would make more sense maybe to do five rounds of optimization where you do 10 experiments at each round, because that way you get through them a lot faster because you can run 10 experiments in parallel. So we investigated that. And it seemed that across batch size, the performance of the optimizer was roughly constant. So here we've got in pink just a random selection, which is just a control. And purple and blue represent first improvement and top and sample. Yeah, so the performance is roughly constant across batch size, not, not, nothing really statistically significant. And expected improvement does consistently outperform constant sampling, which we did find in other areas of the project as well. So another thing that we wanted to test um, in addition to batch size was seeing whether the choice of initial experiments matters. So obviously, when you're starting out around optimization, you have to choose some initial experiments to build your model from. And before what we were doing is just choosing them uniformly at random from all possible conditions. But in actuality, if you're trying to optimize the yield of some chemical reaction, what you might be doing is you're starting off with a bunch of different experiments which have pretty poor yields and you're trying to improve on that. So what we looked at was trying to see, okay, what if we select our initial experiments uniformly from the worst 10% of conditions? And just like we've done like a little box plot here, and the optimized performance actually seems like pretty good. It's quite close to 100%. Although as you can see in the box plot, the lower and upper quarter are quite close together for the bottom 10%. So we hypothesize this is because if you're starting from such poor conditions, the optimizer might be gravitating towards a common local maximum. So as you can see in the purple one, which is just selecting it normally from uniformly all the conditions, it managed to access even better conditions than just selecting the worst 10%. So we tried to the second project we decided to apply the optimizer to was this thing called the Harvard Clean Energy Project. So this is a, like a very large undertaking where they computationally screen something like 2 million or so molecules <coughs> for use in organic photovoltaics. So trying to see whether they could use these chemicals in solar panels. And I think they did some sort of like quantum chemistry calculations on this. But our idea was if we use this as some sort of training set and see if that Edel optimizer also works for this, maybe instead of having to manually brute force all the different possible chemicals, you could use Bayesian optimization to identify ones with much better um, conversion efficiency values and just brute force search. And of course, this, this is quite a different problem domain to just doing reaction and optimization. Like what, for one, because this is just a one dimensional list of molecules, right? As opposed to if you're doing reaction optimization, you've got like many different factors at play, like pressure and temperature, 
which catalyst you use, et cetera. So it was, it was quite a different problem to try to use the optimizer. And surprisingly, the optimizer actually performed pretty well compared to the random control. So of course, we couldn't test it on the whole data set of 2 million plus molecules. So instead we took <coughs> some fixed sample of 10,000 molecules that we used. And in the data set, they gave us the smiles values of the molecules, which I think maybe a percent of the four talked about, which is essentially some sort of unique molecular identifier. So we use that to just, with I think it was a um, Morgan fingerprint encoding that we used to calculate molecular descriptors, things like the mass of the molecule, <coughs> things to do with the configuration of the molecule. And that was actually how we converted the molecules into some numerical vector representation, which is then the model can use. As you can see here, again, expected improvement in Thompson sampling. Expected improvement slightly outperforms Thompson sampling, but when we actually ran it on computers, expected improvement takes around four times as long. Because in order to calculate the average, you've got to run many, many different samples of it and take an average. So having seen that the optimizer actually does work on a different problem domain, we went back to the original goal of reaction yield optimization. We just looked at a different data set, not one that was used in the original paper. This was the <coughs> palladium catalyzed cross coupling data set. So I think the original idea in the paper was they're trying to automate the testing of many, many different reaction conditions at a time at a small scale using robotics. So I guess this is sort of um, a different approach to trying to find the best possible reaction conditions. Rather than running a few different experiments but using a smart algorithm, you try to design your tool so that you can run many, many experiments at the same time, just at a very, very small scale. But in any case, this did provide a useful data set for us to explore and try to test the optimizer on. So the challenge was that, so they gave us um, a list of possible, so like ligands, spaces, et cetera, and they, you can multiply those together to get the full space. But there were some combinations that they just hadn't done experiments for. So we had these gaps in the search space that we had to deal with somehow. <clears throat> so initially what we did is that, for those gaps in the search space where we didn't actually have experimental data, but we still wanted to provide a value to our model, we just put a default value of zero. But what happened, um, as you can see on the left-hand side of the graph, is that the model like, still performed better than random, but the mean values and the median values were not as high as we'd expected, comparing to the actual maximum values in the data set. So, Instead, what we did is it's say, okay, even though that we know that we've got these experiments, which we should technically have data for, but we weren't provided data, we're just going to ignore those experiments and restrict the domain of our search space to just the experiments that we had data for. And that did improve the performance of the model, as you can see on the right there. Um, yeah, so I guess this was a problem that we ran into a couple of times during the project, where because you don't actually have access to physical labs, you couldn't actually um, do anything beyond data sets that we just found in different papers. So if the model suggested, oh, maybe this is a certain combination of conditions that could provide a really good yield that just hadn't been tested yet, we couldn't actually go out and test that in a lab, which would have been useful. So overall, I think what we found is that the optimizer does perform well on the initial data sets. You know, from its original paper, but also in other problems to do with reaction yield optimization. In varying the batch size or the acquisition function used or the experiment budget doesn't actually seem to affect performance too badly. There were some issues that arise when you've got these gaps in the domain, where you've got these missing experiments which you don't have values for. Um, but apart from that, the optimizer seems to perform quite well. And even in domains where we haven't originally expected it 
for the former. Like after all, trying to find a molecule that best converts solar energy into electricity is a quite different problem from trying to find a set of reaction conditions that gives you the best yield. Yet the same optimizer works well on both of them. And in terms of future work, of course, trying to apply this to other different domains in chemistry would be useful. And obviously physical labs would be useful. <coughs> but also I think one issue that happens with this is that you need to give the optimizer the whole set of experiments you're going to do ahead of time. Like, okay, these are the list of possible experiments. But in actuality, if you're trying to use this in real life, it might make sense to continually update that list to say, okay, <clears throat> this particular combination of reaction conditions is not allowed. It's just, it's not going to give us any good yield. So you just remove that from the model. So trying to do optimization on some sort of dynamic search space rather than a static one would be useful. <clears throat> but yeah, I just, I'd like to thank the A4SD network for giving me the opportunity to carry out my project, as well as my supervisors, Stephen Gao and supervising professors, Professor Madison Ranjan and Professor Jeremy Frey. Yeah, um, thanks for listening. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to ask them. Sorry, answer them. <laughs>